WI speaker event for the few of you that can make it. Um, today we have Dr. Charles Morgan coming to talk to us about uh, neuroscience and psychology and a whole, a whole gamut of things. Um, right now he is a professor of national security studies at the University of New Haven. Uh, his focus is teaching uh, national security studies, domestic and international intelligence uh, analysis, and issues in deception. Dr. Morgan is developing a concentration in the human aspects, intelligence analysis, and psycho uh, psychological operations arenas that are relevant to the intelligence community. Um, he has a pretty robust background with military folks, doing research at SEER school, helping with selection processes for special operations forces down at Fort Bragg, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So without further ado, I will hand it off to you. Thank you. Um, it's nice to be here. Actually, I was a Navy guy. I wasn't Army, but I've done more work with the Army, I think, over all these years than I ever did with the Navy. So, uh, so what I would like to talk to you a little bit about today is something I was asked to do in 2010 and 2011. Um, I was getting ready to leave over at the CIA, where I'd worked for a number of years, and the Intelligence Science Board said, could you give us a brief on what's in, st what's in store for us in the future? I was like, I don't know, predicting the future is really hard. Um, so I told my boss at the time, I said, well, I think the best I'll do is make an estimate over what I think is going to happen in the next five years, uh, given certain technologies that were being developed at the time. And this is a bit of an extension of that. I presented it to the ASSG, and uh, it was some information I think some people didn't know, and I think the, it's good for people to be aware of what's going on out there. The, the one thing that makes predicting a little bit of the future easier when you look at biomedical science is that labs are working fairly systematically with overtly stated goals. So if you think about it, science is not really done in a haphazard way. It takes time, preparation. You have to test multiple hypotheses, develop techniques. So it is not really rocket science to look at a lab and say, this is where they're going. And here are probably two of the Achilles heel points in the design. But if they surmount those, they will probably achieve what they say they want to do. So that's a little bit of what this is about. Um, I was going to give you my thoughts on mind, body, and beyond, gene slicing, uh, the Dr. Ventner's work, uh, DNA encryption, and something about memory, that the past is not what it used to be. What I'd like you to consider for a minute is that one of the things that most people uh, have a hard time understanding is that there is a difference between our mind and our body. Your personal experience is usually of an integrated uh, operating system since the time you were little. However, there has been a plan in many labs to figure out how do we help people whose bodies don't work in the way that they want them to do, who have neurologic defects. Could you uh, start the first video? So as a way of surmounting that, people are experimenting five or six years so ago, or as early, early as 2008. With whether or not you can do a brain robotic interface. I don't know if there's a volume for that. That we go through with our monkeys as they go through and try to learn how to use this robot. So they're using um, brain signals, so signals from their motor cortex that we um, pull out of, of wires into our system, and our computers then um, decode what it is that, that the monkey is intending to do and uh, drive the end point of this arm forward and backward and around through space. The monkeys have brain control over this robotic arm to uh, move it forward and grab a piece of fruit as it's presented and then bring it back to their mouth uh, to feed themselves. Incredible as it may seem, these monkeys learned to feed themselves with a robot arm that was being directly controlled by their brains, as if it was simply part of them. This is a biofeedback, closed loop kind of experiment, and that there's an automatic, almost an automatic learning that's going on, um, where we're communicating with the... So essentially, um, when you're little and you're growing up and you're learning how to work your appendages, you are making good motor neuron connections and inhibitory connections. And what they're able to do back in 2008 uh, with a primate is have it learn through trial and error that by thinking it can move a robotic arm and feed itself. Uh, it didn't take too long for the uh, neural interface issue to be resolved once people figured out you could implant electrodes on brain tissue and then take a biological signal and turn it into an electrical signal and amplify it. 
it took a little while for the monkeys to uh, figure out how to do it early on. They would give it a little joystick, so it was like playing a video game. And pretty soon the monkeys, uh, actually there's a chimp that's done it as well, she figured out she just didn't need to use the uh, little joystick and could just think about it. Um, and then the arm would move, and the monkey would begin to experiment and would think about where it wanted the arm to go. So it was learning, I have a new appendage. Uh, the same is true in people. As you can see, just four years later, uh, we see it being done in humans. You can start that for me, please. With people who have neurologic injury and can't use their limbs. I don't know if it'll play. Um, yeah, try and hover over the screen, I think. There we go. Oh, drag it down. There you go. Perfect. Yeah, it's right there. My life has changed dramatically since the accident. As of right now, there's nothing to cure paralysis, um, besides maybe a miracle. The first thing I'd do if I get my arms back, I would hug my daughter. It'd be really nice to scoop something up on a spoon and feed myself again. This is going to go beyond spinal cord if this works. This is going to go MS. This is going to go stroke. This is huge. This is millions and millions and millions of people. I'm pretty much broken from the neck down, I guess you could say. The only thing that I have left that is untouched is my brain. And uh, obviously, I'm able to use it very good. I'm able to do this and do that. Um, you know, no memory loss, no nothing. So I opted for an experimental surgery to go at the one thing that I still have. What we try to do is uh, put a, a, a grid in place that's capable of recording signals from the brain. So when you think, when you think I want to move, there's actually electrical impulses in the brain. We want to be able to record those electrical impulses and then decode what, what the electrical impulses mean and use that to control an object or an arm. That's what People have thought for a long time that we might be able to tap into the brain, but it's only recently that we've gotten closer and closer. Uh, there's some great work going on here at the University of Pittsburgh by a, a gentleman named Andy Schwartz. And Andy has shown that he can get a monkey to control a robotic arm with an amazing degree of freedom by thought. So we've developed technology where we can implant an array of electrodes, microelectrodes, in the cerebral cortex of monkeys. And we can record activity from many neurons in the brain simultaneously. And from that signal, we can extract the monkey's intention to move its arm. And now that we have that, we can have intercept that signal and use it, instead of moving the monkey's own arm, to use it to move a prosthetic arm. Just two weeks. Yeah. I think he said it acts just What it takes to really get into people is a, is a large team. So we've basically been somewhat isolated in our laboratory, working on monkeys, proving the technology, just making discoveries, validating the technology, developing new ways of doing this. And what we've been able to do recently is pass a lot of this knowledge that we've gained to clinical um, colleagues. They came to the laboratory, learned a lot of what we're doing, and then took it back to the clinic and developed the technology as appropriate for humans. We were implanting our first uh, patient in a clinical trial to place subdural grids for electrodes on the surface of the brain uh, in an attempt to use them as the brain computer interface for the ultimate goal of controlling the prosthetic arm. And we'll start out simply with trying to do some cursor control hoping that over the 28 days that he's implanted, that we will be able to progress to potentially being able to control a robotic arm. Two days after the surgery, um, we plugged me in and started to basically train my brain, train the computer to my brain the way I'm thinking. The computer doesn't know up, down, left, right. It just knows the signals that I'm thinking. For the first couple days, it was just, what's up, what's down? Uh, how I do it is I look at the ball, at the top and through my peripheral vision I see the ball that's moving so I'm, I'm focusing on the target and almost with my peripheral if I want to go up I'm with my mental eyes or whatever you want to call it lifting up trying to get that ball to go up or trying to get it to go down so I'm focusing on the target while watching the moving ball with my peripheral it's like a one-player video game I'm trying to beat my own score because there is a score you know there's a certain percentage it's out of six, you know, each time I do it, it's out of 16 um, balls, if you want to say. 
and uh, I want to know that number. If it's 13, I want the 14, or I want the 15. And um, so it's just a challenge to myself. One thing I found out that if I focus too hard, it doesn't work right. It has to be very natural. That's pretty good. Yeah, yeah not too bad. We're making such ground on this every single day. Um, every other day we're just going leaps and bounds. And knowing that we're doing that, if I had another week or two weeks or month, where would we be then? Um, we'd be, I mean, we've already done stuff that's unprecedented. You know, I've been, I've been doing stuff, I've been told, um, that with the 3D curse control, people have been doing it for a year, two years, um, that they haven't got the type of control and percentages that I've gotten um, in a day, literally a day. The highlight was 45 minutes ago. Uh, I got to use a robotic arm for the first time, and uh, I got to reach out and touch somebody for the first time in seven years. So what you see is people struggled with how to get the electrodes on the surface of the brain, how to do the brain learning. The computer algorithms have improved. This is by trial and error as it begins to recognize what the subject's brain is doing. But after that, if you look at that as a scientific development in medicine, you can quickly see the possibilities that emerge, right? They're playing with motor function and linking it to thought. So the next step, really, when you think about it, was to um, simultaneously try it with uh, another, another non-human animal and find out if she could run a robot on the other side of the planet. And the essence of this experiment is, at first she had to walk on the treadmill to keep the robot walking that she could observe on the computer screen, and then she just stopped walking and it would run the robot in Japan. So you can have a brain here in the United States plugged in, running a robotic device, a mechanical device, via the internet somewhere else in the world. So that was pretty cool. It also has some fun implications. If you see now, where do you imagine this going when you think of it as an offensive or defensive opportunity with respect to the intelligence community? The natural segue then would be, if I can send motor function from a brain to a mechanical arm, is it possible to send motor functions from one human to another human? So I call it the possession experiment. Oh, it's on a, it's that one, yeah. Just have to hover the, uh, there you go, right there. for our weekly tech report. Now, do you know the phrase brain power? Well, it turns out that scientists at the University of Washington are trying to hone that power and transmit it to another brain. Researchers call it direct brain-to-brain -brain communication, and they do it by passing a signal from one mind to the next, using the internet nonetheless. So does it sound a little sci-fi, Star Trek mind meld, Jedi mind trick inception-esque to you? Well, it did to me too. So I brought one of the researchers onto the show to tell me how it works. Dr. Andrea Stoko is an assistant research professor at the University of Washington, and he told me why this concept is not as weird as it sounds. Oh, uh, it's not so science fiction. We use uh, current existing technologies to read uh, the brain patterns in a person and uh, to transmit them to a different person. And we can only do it with very simple uh, impulses right now, like motor commands to control the hand, for instance. So it's not that science fiction. It was definitely possible years ago. It's just that we were the first to try it. Sure. So can you go into a little bit more detail about how specifically it works, or what you need from the person, and also what you need from mm -hmm. wireless internet to, to make it come together? Yes. Uh, it works more or less like this. A person is sitting on a chair, and we call this person the first brain or the sender, and is connected to an EEG cap. The EEG cap detects electrical activity all around the brain and is capable of recognizing when the brain patterns are those that a person produces when he's trying to move the right hand or is thinking about moving the right hand. These brain patterns are interpreted by a computer who then controls a second computer who is connected over the internet, and the second computer action, uh, controls a stimulating coil that produces a magnetic field. And it's the magnetic field that is eventually directed over the head in such a way as to reproduce the particular command in a selected part of the brain. <clears throat> in this case, the part of the brain that controls the right hand. 
The wireless connection enters only in the communication between the two computers. The two computers can be in the same room and connected physically, or they can be in any part of the world and talking to each other through the internet. So I won't, you can watch the video, but essentially what's happening is when one person is playing the video game, they're not using their hands. They're simply looking at targets. What's going on in the other room is a transcranial magnetic stimulation device that creates a magnetic field that excites neurons. And it's the other man's hand that begins to move and hits the targets. So you've co-opted the portion of a body of another human and then their hand can behave in the way that you want it to do. His goal, you'll see later if you download the video, is he would like to have a cap that you could put on and have a surgeon direct your hands to do battlefield surgery or something somewhere else in the world where they don't have a doctor who has the technical skills. You can put on the cap and your hands become an extension of that expert's body. The uh, fine motor skill manipulation at that point in time was not great, um, but the person on the receiving end described the sensation as rather odd. He said, I didn't know anything until I saw my hand beginning to move and felt that it was something other. And its hand was moving, the hand could punch in a code, the hand could do a number of things. But the really fun part was that you're taking over somebody else's physical body with the mind of another human. So what do you think would be the next step? You follow medical research, you say, you can make a robot move, you can make a human hand move, um, what would you do next? You say, wow, they're getting brains connected to run things. And you have to begin to think either like doctors or like uh, you know, security and intelligence people, right? Can you actually send and receive sensory information? like the matrix. I'll show you a little bit of this experiment. The short answer is yes. We were able to transmit brain-derived information from one rat to another, and basically got this pair of animals collaborating to solve tactile and motor tasks. You know, there's a behavior box where the first animal is located, and this animal is called the encoder because he's the one who does all the work. He's basically using his forepaws or his whiskers to perform either a motor or a tactile discrimination task. And while he's doing that, we are monitoring uh, its behavior and recording the brain activity that is being produced by this animal's brain and transmitting in real time all these uh, electrical signals to a second animal that is called the decoder. Well, this animal has the lucky job of not having to do anything for getting a reward. The only thing it has to do is to receive this brain activity uh, into its own brain and then decode the pattern of information that the encoder has generated and indicate to us, uh, as through behavior, what it is that the first animal has discovered out there in the environment. So if the decoder gets it right, both animals get a nice uh, juicy reward. And that's what they want. And that's how they collaborate to actually get this job done. Uh, here you see in the next slide, an uh, encoder animal waiting for a light stimulus that tells the animal which of two levers he has to press to get a little bit of uh, a water sip. And the light says either press left or the right lever. So when the animal gets the light and is about to press the lever, we record the activity, electrical activity, from lots of cells in the motor cortex of this animal and instantaneously transmit this information through the brain of a second animal that is in another box and cannot see the light and cannot see what the first animal is doing. This is the decoder, and he's receiving this information through very tiny little pulses of electrical activity that are delivered to the homologous part of the brain that the encoder is using to solve the task. So as the decoder gets this information and basically decodes the brain pattern originated in the encoder's brain, it responds to us behaviorally by pressing one or the other uh, lever to tell us that he got it right or not. So it took some learning trials, but not many took 75 between them to achieve an accuracy rate of over 85 percent 
in just training their rats for a little while in the cages. But this was a milestone because it was not simply using the motor cortex to run a device. This was actually having one animal learn something and seeing and recording that activity and put it into the sensory cortex of the second animal and that animal acquires the knowledge. It is able to act on the knowledge from the experience of, for something it has not ever done. Which is really fun when you think about it. Uh, would this facilitate language learning? Would this let you upload information when you don't know how to operate a device? Does it serve well for covert communication? This is done between two rats. What we do know um, is that DARPA did get permission for 500 um, operations to do deep brain electrode implants. They haven't published anything yet, but my guess is what you're looking at is human-human thought transference. And certainly in the open science world, that was published uh, last month, actually, the brain-to-brain -brain transfer of sensory information in two humans. And they achieved a success rate of being right 85% of the time. So you can attach one human brain to a device you can attach the human brain to another human brain. You can direct motor activity, or you can send communication and information. What we know from the training trial data so far is that it probably requires, uh, it'll probably require a training trial between people as well. And we don't know from an encryption and encoding standpoint um, whether everybody's communication would follow the same patterns or not. It may be that two people have to train, and then it's unique, and then you have a yeah, a decryption problem for someone if they decide they can intercept the signal, right? That would be, but you could plug in somewhere else in the world and learn something or see something or have somebody acquire the information that you have and you wouldn't have to carry a different device. So that's what people are doing. There's a whole world out there of biohacking. I don't know if you're aware of it, but you should be. So normally at the university, we are well regulated by the uh, uh, federal laws about studying and experimenting on humans. There is a biohacking community that is not part of the official science community that is busy trying to attach hardware to humans and they do it in their basements. Uh, they study up on how to do the surgeries, how to connect devices, how to put motherboards in people. Um, and they may use it for some purposes like phishing, using RFID signals in their hands to take information from you. But uh, there are some other interesting developments. When you start thinking about the fluidity of what you can do with the brain, they're experimenting with CE6 and giving people with eye drops night vision. For several hours, a person receiving the night drops can see over 160 feet in the dark. So it's a lot easier to look through your own eyes than it is to put on nods. And it will be a short time before you get a better solution than we get from the biohacking community. But it could also be readily available to almost anybody on the planet. Um, it's, be, it's going to be harder to keep this under control than it is to keep the special lenses and uh, night vision technology. Um, so uh, I think it's really important that people pay attention to, to this kind of a thing because that can give humans the natural ability for a while to see in the dark. The other new possibility coming along is that seeing in the dark is something you don't really naturally do that well. Uh, but with animals, we've been able to achieve a, num a number of other things, one of which is giving them uh, an extra sensory ability, if you will. I'll show you a short clip. People decided they wanted to know if they could give the rat an ability to do something it does not naturally have. Recently, researchers have given rats an implant which allows the animal to obtain, as they call it, a sixth sense. The laboratory subjects were able to search and detect infrared lights, which is an exceptional accomplishment given that rats cannot normally see infrared lights. A team at Duke University placed infrared detectors which were wired up to tiny electrodes into the part of their brains that processes tangible information. A source involved with the experiment, Eric Thompson states, This is the first paper in which a neuroprosthetic device was used to augment function, literally enabling a normal animal to acquire a sixth sense. Researchers claim that the device could also help humans regain sight if placed in the appropriate part of the brain. Last year, researchers used a computer chip ridden prosthetic system to help transmit light signals in the brains of mice. The minds behind the study hoped to move on to human trials using the retinal device to restore sight to those who had lost their vision. So people are playing with chemicals to enhance the human capacity. They're also experimenting now with how do you add a device to the mammalian brain to give it an extra sensory ability. You may not want to detect infrared. You might want to have a room temperature detector of radiation depending on what your job is in life. So when you think about it, 
Uh, the possibility now is there to develop different kinds of devices. They could be perhaps used either by intelligence people or by uh, uh, people in the military to have an extra ability to be able to see through walls, to uh, see heartbeats. We used to play with the uh, 18 gigahertz microwave uh, detectors where we could pick up heartbeats through anything but solid steel and water, but that could easily be a human who can see the unique heartbeat that's behind the wall over there that's thermal and sensitive. So it doesn't have to be IR. Uh, it can be a number of things. Anything that you can co-opt is theoretically now possible to adapt to human brain functioning. All you'd have to learn is the code. You'd have to train with it. It might not be natural at first. You might not understand the signal you're getting, uh, but you can add to human brain function. You can also use it to intercept signals. Uh, the experiment that was just released this last month, uh, as I said, demonstrated that people could transfer knowledge from one human to another. And I, I commented to uh, a couple of my colleagues and I said, I think right now the most direct application of that is going to be either covert communication or running drones. The set of experiments, I didn't have videos to show you, um, but there have been a series that have shown you can connect the human brain to a rat and control its motor movement and its tail. So you can have non-human animal drones. You can have the human brain probably run a regular drone at this point, but uh, running a non-human drone, something like a cockroach or a rat, would it be awesome. And now the, if you were watching the Olympics and you see the coordinated maze of drones, the software is now really readily available where you could, uh, you could have hordes of little creatures that can gain access to facilities um, or, or move around in different places, all run by a person sitting in a booth. Um, it wouldn't be, it's no more technically challenging once you do that than figuring out the logistics of how you're going to send your signal somewhere else in the world and how to protect that signal. But um, that's, that's now, that's not um, in the future. So as you begin to think what's in five years, the interfaces are going to become um, more delicate, more refined, and as transcranial magnetic stimulation, it's a rather crude instrument right now. It creates a field that excites just hordes of neurons, but as they as they um, refine the technology so you can get a better point specificity to the neurons you actually want to activate, you should be able to do this without penetrating the skull. Um, either someone could wear a cap, and in fact, that's how the latest brain-to-brain -brain communication in humans was done. It was done without surgery and uh, actually signaling uh, via some stimulation to the retina and the brain decoding it, although the person consciously didn't know what the code was, the brain did. Um, so that I would recommend people becoming aware of that uh, from the human drone technology standpoint. The second field uh, that people may or may not be aware of, in, uh, I always tell my students, I said I wasn't around when they developed uh, atomic weapons, but um, Dr. Ventner's work is, my, my view, the equivalent of the development of nuclear weapons when you realize uh, that he created life in a cell back in 2010. I don't know if people are familiar with his work, but this technology paired with something called CRISPR, which is like an editing software for genes, makes a number of things immediately available. What he did is he programmed yeast cells to produce anything he wanted. They can produce perfume, they can produce petroleum, they can produce any peptide, anything we program the DNA to do, and it's in the living cell. Right, so in medicine, the goal in medicine now is to be able to do uh, designer medicine and therapy if we can design a cell to get into your body and release the right product for you, you won't be losing half the drugs you take through your liver when you swallow a pill and it gets digested. These can be inserted into you through the hypospray uh, needles, almost like Dr. McCoy on Star Trek, giving you the hyperspray. It just blasts now plasmids into your squamous cells. But uh, Ventner was able to do that and has the patent on the technology. But you can engineer anything. You can engineer a unique thing that would only kill one person in the world. It's how it's done. You put in a specific gene slicing, you program what you like, you put it in the cell, and it can reproduce and make as much as you like. For those of you who don't know, your DNA is usually all wrapped up in tight little coils. And so what you're doing is when they create plasmids and put them into cells, it sends a signal and tells which portion of the DNA should unwrap, unfold, and produce a product. Now this is the future of medicine. Uh, when you look at this technology in medicine and say, this is going to be done to help people, right? We want to be able to give them medicines. We actually want to correct for genetic deficits. If a kid's born with a genetic anomaly with the CRISPR technology, the feeling is we can create the portion of the gene they're missing and go have it spliced back in. 
and that may help a child either if it's in utero development or once they're older to have the missing substance actively produced. What would you do with this if you were in security and intelligence? Well, you can do a number of things. You could decide if you make this gene, we know that certain people in the world who function at very high altitudes very, very well do it because they had a special mutation in their genome that we don't have because we didn't grow up in the Himalayas. But they can function at very high altitudes. Could you give this to people who are going to have to do war fighting in high altitudes and they don't require extra support? Their body makes a much more efficient use and can work under conditions of lower oxygen than the rest of us. You start letting your mind wander. Can it also produce a substance that lets you um, function longer underwater without oxygen? So, but these are run by certain mutations in genes. And with CRISPR, we have the ability to actually make these and see what happens when we give them to animals, non-human or human animals, that don't have it naturally. You could have the Forrest Gump gene. You guys have been tracking. There's a gene that just makes you stronger. I would say that most of this technology is probably going to be employed by a state and not non-state actors because it's quite technical. But I say that with a caveat. When we study the Um Shinrikyo, um, if people remember, they had both uranium mines and regular uh, laboratories where they experimented on both uh, animals and uh, had a whole series of laboratory experiments to develop uh, the uh, different kinds of gases that they wanted. Their goal was to actually mine uranium and probably come up with their own version of a nuclear weapon. But they recruited scientists, PhD level folks, uh, and their goal was to be the rightful people running the country of Japan. But we can't assume that just because they're non-state actors, they will not um, make use of some technology around this. Related to this is an idea called dreads. These are designer receptors that can be remotely controlled. So think about it for a moment. You can create a designer receptor. You can create a cell. You can put it somewhere in the body. And you can remotely activate it when the brain's exposed to the right signal. Using this technology, people have been able to transfer memories from one fruit fly to another by signaling through a, a light stimulus uh, into the retina. Right now, in, in most animals, it's done by putting a substance into their body uh, that will actually activate the neuron in the way that you want it. So you have the capacity to create any product. As long as you know the DNA sequence, you can insert it into a living system, and you can remotely control it. So in medicine, we think about how we do that to help people, how we do to repair deficits. Other people are going to think about how do they do it to expand possibilities. Now, one of the challenges that we have is that when you create a cell and you put it in somebody's body, you have to figure out where you want it. What if you want it in their brain? Right? If you want it in their brain and you can't figure out you don't want to do surgery to plant it in their brain, if I want a product produced in your brain that may affect the way you think, the way you act, one route to that is through uh, stem cells. If you're a quick brush up on your biology, stem cells are cells, they're called them God cells. They can turn into anything. They hold the potential, unlike other cells in your body, to become anything you want them to become. And they can go find their home in the body and park there and do the work that you'd like them to do. You can infuse them, and they will find their way into the brain. So once you know that the technology is there to edit, splice, and program a cell, and the technology currently exists to administer it to somebody and have it go park anywhere you program it to go park, proliferate, and do its function, you can have things activated in other people's brains. So if you take these three key points, hopefully you can see it opens up a number of both alarming and exciting possibilities. You can have the timed release of information on demand. Hopefully, when I mention the word CRISPR and word editing and creating molecules with CRISPR out of D and playing with DNA, some of you thought encryption and encoding. 
So DNA encryption, it, there were, I think, eight articles published by China in the course of three years, uh, in the last three years. And uh, it's uh, quite important. The coding system, DNA steganography, I'll just say short, the short story on this is people have figured out how to hide imagery in the DNA of bacteria. And when you uh, phosphoresce the bacteria, you can discover the information. Or you can have the, those are just to remind me, you can have the information uh, reproduced in a string form as a form of a protein. Dr. Church up at Harvard uh, has shown quite well that you can store a lot of information in one gram of DNA. It's essentially, yeah, that many, that many iPads in one gram at room temperature. No supercooling required. DNA is highly stable. It's been around on the planet a very long time. So between CRISPR, the storage capacity, and programming cells, the new way to uh, hide information is going to be in DNA. The commercial application is going to be a bit like on Star Trek years ago. Why would you have a digital system when you can have a DNA system you can store all the information you'd ever need, records, photos, anything. It's simply another way of storing information. It had just been so slow up until five years ago, it wouldn't be thought to be practical. But it is. This is the first experiment showing what imagery you can hide in bacteria. This is the latest. It's a GIF file. It was actually programmed into the DNA of bacteria last year. The bacteria reproduced, and the offspring from the reproduction cycle would still produce this movie. Pretty cool. You can hide information in bacteria. And when the bacteria multiply, they can go into a spore form and last for a very long time. No one can scan you and find a bacteria. We don't have anything that can detect that. When, you know, so if you want to be able to encode information, take pictures of information, create something in DNA and don't want it in your own body, it can be bacteria on some portion of your body, right? All they have to do is scrape it, let it grow in the Petri dish, and unpack the information. This is all available now. This isn't science fiction, but you can encode movies. Well, this is what the Chinese are doing with DNA. So in your own neck of the woods, you can begin inquiring. <laughs> we are doing things with, uh, with DNA as well. But the Chinese are fairly convinced that DNA encryption and encoding would be one tremendous challenge even for quantum computing. Uh, so this is where the race is right now, trying to merge quantum computing with um, what you'd call a wet hard drive with DNA. Merging DNA systems with quantum uh, uh, computing will be really quite an amazing and both lethal threat for that. The next thing I wanted to mention to you is memory. Can you play this one really quick? Hopefully you'll recognize this. Hey, whoever you guys are, you're going to have to show me some idea if you're going to be in the house. Hey, whoever you guys are, you're going to have to show me some idea. Hey, whoever you guys are, you guys. Would you stop that? What? That, that thing is going to give her brain cancer or something. Hey, whoever you guys are, you guys. Gonna... So, what to do with memory? In medicine, we think of memory as a potentially harmful thing when people present with post-traumatic stress disorder. They can't stop thinking about the thing that's creating emotional distress. It's a very active development in the field to figure out, can we erase memory? Can we modify memory? Can we change memory? The short answer is yes. Several years ago, with the PAM Zeta data out of Duke University, this was the first time that anyone had ever demonstrated that if you wash an area of the brain called the hippocampus, it's an area of our brain that's crucial for forming short memories, spatial memories, and then facilitating the transfer from a short-term memory to something that's more permanent and stable over time, that he could train the mice to run the maze, document the number of trials and errors, and then flood their hippocampus or expose it to this, and the memory would be completely gone, meaning when the rats or the mice had to learn it over again, it was the same number of learning trials. And there was no trace of the memory left. Now, the good news 
uh, for us when we study rats and mice is we put electrodes and cannuli into their brain and can directly affect that area of the brain. If you wanted to poke your own hippocampus, you'd have to stick your finger through your eye and go right back in there. Sounds impossible to get to. Not if you program a cell to go there. So if you decide you wanted to program something that would selectively release PKM zeta after your meeting with someone, they probably would have no memory of it. That's what's happening in the rats. Right? So the technical challenge right now is, how do we get a cell in there to do that in a human? I can assure you they're working on that in non-human primates right now. How many, what's the point specificity? Can we get it in there close enough to the hippocampus? Will those cells start reproducing in the next day, make enough of that stuff to wipe out a memory? Related to this, once you start thinking about memory, are chemicals that not only wipe out memory, but chemicals that enhance it. So if you want a better human camera, a better, uh, uh, an individual who can just go see and remember everything, uh, that's the direction that the research in this lane is taking to help people with Alzheimer's. How to give them memory back. So what's being actively studied are the few people on the planet who have hypermnesia. In other words, they remember everything that's ever happened to them. We're actively trying to understand how to unlock that and unpack that and figure out why it is their memory does seem to record and they retain everything they've seen. They don't find it pleasant uh, and medicine would like to, people in medicine want to try and understand that so they can turn it into something beneficial for people who are losing memory. From a security and intelligence uh, standpoint, it is a really unique uh, opportunity to begin to discover can you administer a drug that enhances human memory for a certain number of hours? Does it have to be permanent? So rather than carrying technical toys somewhere to try and record and collect information, your brain just remembers it, which doesn't give anybody anything really to detect. So that's one potential use for it, and that is one lane of research uh, that's going on. That was just my picture to remind me that the man who knew too much, if you remember the old Hitchcock film, Essentially, that's what he'd done, remember, is memorize all the steps on how to make a bomb. Uh, he'd remembered the codes. He'd remembered everything. That research on hypermemory has gone more slowly than I thought in 2010. I thought by about uh, 2015 there would be some progress. There hasn't been uh, much yet in expanding memory very much. It seems to be a harder nut to crack than erasing memory. Erasing memory seems to be far easier. The last topic I wanted to uh, review with you is memory. I don't know if you recognize any of the imagery up there, but I'll walk you through it. Uh, with memory, in the last five years, what's been demonstrated is that you can train a fruit fly around uh, an aversive experience, and you can transfer that memory to the brain of another fruit fly by manipulating uh, the rods. Uh, and it gives it a memory for something that it's never had before, and then it reacts to the stimulus in the same way as the animal who did have the aversive learning uh, experience. It's been done in mice. I'll talk a little bit about what Beth Loftus and I have done to men and women going through Sears school and changing memory. Uh, and I put the last slide up because this is in flatworms and this came out two years ago, that memory really is something beyond what we uh, typically understand in flatworms. You can cut their head off and their body still remembers stuff. So the, uh, they're just beginning to uncode or decode where and how is memory stored in the body of this little creature so we can translate that into memory in animals that look different than that little creature. It's evolved it for a very interesting reason. So this is this, in 2009 using light. They've transferred, uh, they transferred memory. You can turn things on and off uh, using light in animals to activate the hippocampus, turn memory on and off. And so where are we with humans in creating false memories, giving them memories that they've never had? We've come a long way. My colleague is Beth Loftus. This was her early work. It was called Lost in a Mall. And what she did is she asked a person to be in the study. You could be in her study if you had a sibling that was at least five years older than you. And she'd say, we're interested in your memory from when you were a kid. I've asked your older sibling, your older brother or sister, uh, to give me four stories about you, and I want to know how much you remember. What people didn't know is that there were four different stories. One of them was fake. And she wanted to see how long it would take for them to adopt a false memory. 
The quick answer is after two interview sessions, 30% of the subjects believed that they remembered the person who'd found them when they were lost at a mall and actually argued with the researcher uh, about whether or not the memory was true or not. And that's how I met her. And we decided to get together and run up to Brunswick to Sears School and try a memory experiment. This is our design. If you're not familiar with SEER, there's a classroom phase, there's an experiential phase. We were interested in sampling people when they were in isolation, when they were returning their gear, and at the end. And we tried a couple of different techniques. Group one, there's no misinformation. We simply want to sample accuracy of human memory for their experience. And we told them at the beginning of SEER, we want you to be the best little human collector possible. We are going to quiz you about your memory. Don't let us trick you. We want to know what you remember. Group two, we told them the same thing, but we lied. When they took their questionnaire at the end, we incorporated several techniques from false memory techniques, which are a little bit of leading questions to see whether or not we could create false memories. In the third group, we exposed them to an erroneous photograph of their interrogator. And in group three, we used the, group four, we used a video. So here's what we did. By exposing them to a photograph uh, after they had been interrogated and placed in isolation stress, it could change them from this guy to this guy 48 hours later on who they would identify in the lineup. Their level of confidence was an 8 out of 10, uh, that that was the person they had met. We found out we could make them believe that there were guns, that there were knives, that there were caches of weapons, simply by altering the phrasing of a question or inserting something into a video. I'll give you an example. If we said, did your interrogator wear a weapon? If so, please describe it. We only got about a 2% endorsement of the presence of a weapon in the, in the interrogation uh, phase. If we said, when you were being interrogated by your interrogator and the guy with the weapon interrupted the interrogation, what did they argue about? We didn't care what the answer was. We'd ask another question. They'd say, describe the weapon worn by your interrogator. It jumped to 30% would tell us the type of firearm that they had seen in the interrogation booth which is a security violation, right? There, there weren't any. We got to record them. But with one question, we could do that. When you sample with a few more, you can actually increase the sample. So when we increased the stress at SEER, we found that instead of a 30% rate overall, we could create false memories in nearly everyone. That was in 900 people. We, uh, so Beth and I were talking about that. We said, well, you can change memory. We know that. It's a way of understanding maybe why and how people have recovered memories of abuse that never happened. Uh, that's what her work has mainly been about. So she decided to do a study called Licked by Pluto. She decided she couldn't make Mickey Mouse a sex offender, but in her lab they thought Pluto was fair game. The short story is people got to, they were exposed to some misinformation about a man who had dressed in the Pluto outfit at Disney, and he'd been inappropriately rubbing his large fabric tongue on children pleasurably and um, not pleasurably. There were two different conditions, and there was a neutral condition. If people adopted the false memory, and their memory was for something negative, they did not want to buy the Pluto toy, right? When they went down their list, what they would not buy. She's done it with food. That was from her series uh, with Alan Alda. She gave him a false memory that he'd been sick one time eating uh, deviled eggs. And here, they offer him one at the picnic on film, and you get the classic disgust wrinkle, and he said, no, I got, got sick one time eating them. It's not a true memory, it was planted. She's done it now with uh, strawberries and ice cream, also done it with pickles, and has done it with alcohol. A uh, study last year was that if you give college students the false memory that they were terribly hungover, they had a wicked hangover from drinking too much tequila, then when they're given free range options at the bar, uh, like a week later, they decline it at twice the rate of everybody else. They go, nah, I got sick doing that. So think about it. If you change the past, you change human behavior. We are a case-based reasoning animal. When we think about what we're going to do, we think about the last time we did something, or the, what we heard about, or what we think it would have done. So to change human motivation, we don't have to persuade people. You can just change their memory. Think about the defensive and offensive capabilities of that. If you think about this from a defensive standpoint, you have the ability to change the memory of a person who's been debriefed in a safe house about the identities of who they met, the layout, as we've looked at altering memory for floor plans, for faces, for timing. 
if they're wrapped up by their intelligence service, they don't have anything to lie about or what they remember is actually genuine, but it's wrong. Um, that might be a defensive uh, way of applying the technique. Uh, in medicine, people are arguing about whether or not you can use uh, false memories to help people. Can I give you a false memory that leads you to stop smoking, or is it unethical? Because I can't tell you I gave you a false memory. I'd have to do it outside of your permission for your good. Most of us think it's probably unethical. In the society we live in, we think you probably should be an informed consumer. But it's a possibility that you can do. And when I think about this, I think about its relevance in this day and age when you start wondering what information is real and what information is trustworthy. When you start running into people and debriefing them and you have sources who claim things, when you can learn how to create false memories, a person can be genuine and the information they remember is, it is the old dangle idea. You can put information out that's simply not true. But in the current social media age, the ability to actually manage people's memories and change them is, is just enhanced compared to what it used to be. Now you can, you can fix videos and pictures and expose people to audio and visual uh, information. And we know that even if they know that's a possibility, people don't recognize when they adopt a false memory. It's a, it's a bit of a Trojan horse effect. You don't know that it's happened to you. And if you're smart and you have a good memory, you'll believe that happens to other people, but not you, because your memory is true. So it bypasses some critical reasoning on our part. Uh, and I think it's particularly, uh, it's particularly effective. That's where the, where the state of the art is right now for uh, creating false memories in humans, uh, is doing that verbally or by these manipulations with either what we say, what we show them, what we expose them to. Um, but the chemical implanting of memories has now occurred in monkeys. So in trying to restore memory, uh, there is probably, I would say in the next two years, where we should see the science experiment come out that says a memory has actually been transferred or created and planted back into a human brain that wasn't done by a classic uh, false memory technique. But I would anticipate that that's the direction the research is going. How do you rebuild memories in people who've had a TBI? Uh, active research is going on about that on uh, nanite reconstruction of brain, brain cells and, and brain networks. And the idea in the mental health community is people lost part of their brain. We want to restore memory and brain function. Can we put the memories back in? So it's, um, it's probably only science fiction for another two years, uh, given, given the state of the art and the progress uh, around that. And then, uh, and the last thing I'll say, I didn't have any videos for it. I really wanted to sh show you one. But the French have published a very interesting paper. And it is this. While people were sleeping, they were able to train them and sample their knowledge in what they trained them in while they were asleep and while they were later awake and didn't know that they'd learned the information. So I'll say it again. In people who were asleep, they were able to tell what people knew around word recognition lists without ever waking the person up. They were also able to train new memory and information outside the person's awareness while they were asleep. Where that technology can go is some very interesting places. Uh, it would really raise, since I was in the lane of ds and and we talked about deception and everybody was arguing about how to interrogate people, it raises an immediate question about whether or not you can sample information in people's brains um, outside of their awareness. The problem with a CAT scan and a PET scan and any technologies, you have to have a willing subject. They do need to sit still. If people are asleep and you can begin to sample what their brain recognizes, it offers a number of opportunities at looking at guilty knowledge, uh, brain recognition waveforms, and sampling some kinds of information. Um, I don't know how soon it will be when you can link someone's brain to somebody else's um, while they're asleep, but I would imagine that that can't be far off. I I'd probably ballpark it and say, probably five years. Um, if they have to do the brain implants, we'll know sooner, because I, I can't see any other reason why DARPA got approval for 500 deep, plane, deep brain implants. I think the next step is going to be a hive, a hive brain. Uh, it's already been done in rats. You can link multiple brains. And as a hive, they solve problems much faster than the individual uh, rat. 
So that technology is here. I'm, I'm assuming they'll link people who they've given permission, who've given permission to link their brains to have a productive life, live in virtual reality, move robotic things. They can probably problem solve. So I think in the next few years, that's what we'll see: is brain-to-brain -brain linking for problem solving, and to see if it makes it more efficient. Um, but those are a couple of technologies I want to make you aware of. Uh, and then you can run away and think about their more direct applications. I tend to think of things from a medical perspective and from an intelligence and information perspective. Uh, but it's no longer really science fiction, and most of these fields have moved faster uh, than I actually thought in 2010. Uh, the only one has been expanding memory that hasn't, hasn't moved as fast. But I thought I would share that with you, and uh, that's all I had to say. So thank you for your time. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Morgan. We're pretty much out of time, yeah, but yeah. we'll be hanging out up here for a little bit. So if anybody has Great. questions, feel free to come up. And thank you for coming out. See you. Let's pull that on.